Welcome to On the Road with PIC. I'm your host, Tori Walters. Today we'll discuss breeding productivity with on-farm tips to improve breeding herd longevity and piglet survivability with Lori Thomas Kosiemba and Bree Quick, PIC Technical Services Managers. Today, we're gonna start this conversation by discussing strategies to help improve longevity, starting with the sow. Lori will help us understand why this is a topic of concern and what we currently know. I think we can all agree that breeding herd survivability is a genuine concern for all of us in the industry. Today we hope to focus on some strategies that we feel can be implemented on the farm to help improve breeding herd longevity. Keep in mind this list is not all inclusive. We have a limited amount of time with you today, thus we can't touch on everything, but we hope to share information that team members can take into the barn and start making a positive impact. I'm going to start by sharing some industry data created by Ron Ketchum, shared at a recent survivability conference. In this graph, we are looking at female death loss over the last 10 years. The top 10% of producers are in gray and all farms are represented in red. What we can see from this graph is that female death loss has increased by about half a percent per year over the last decade. During this conference, Ron shared that the majority of the removals from the herd are occurring in younger animals, primarily gilts to parity two. There are several problems with this. We know that higher parity sows wean heavier pigs and produce more pigs per year compared to females in lower parities. Thus, we want about 50% of our sows within the herd to be between P3 and P6, as this is considered peak performance for these animals and will allow us to have an ideal parity distribution and ultimately be more profitable. We have some insights on what is causing low retention rates. Again, Ron shared data from across the country, providing an excellent summary of what the industry is dealing with, and he found that most deaths are recorded as unknowns, 25% specifically, followed by lameness, downer pigs, and difficulties during the process of parturition. He also shared that 30% of sow mortality is occurring between day 115 and day 123 of gestation, 30% within an eight day period. And I think most would agree that we typically have the greatest removals around the time of farrowing and the weeks thereafter, as well as an increase during the summer months. These details are very important to help us understand this problem and find ways to mitigate these challenges. Now that we've laid the foundation for today's topic, let's jump into some strategies to improve breeding herd productivity. I'm gonna start in the GDU and walk through the different areas of the farm, highlighting specific opportunities that we feel can make a difference and improve sow retention. The first topic I wanna to briefly mention is gilt selection. As we all know, the gilt is the foundation of our herd and selecting for adequate gilts into the breeding herd is an essential task. Marginal gilts will not meet performance expectations and will not be retained as long as quality gilts. And as I mentioned previously, lameness is one of the main reasons for removals. Thus, it is imperative that we are selecting these females as structurally sound animals. Moving from the GDU into breeding, we recommend hitting these four targets at first breeding in gilts. The first is ensuring gilts reach puberty by 195 days of age skipping this first heat and then allowing females to be bred on their second cycle when they are approximately 200 to 225 days of age and 300 to 350 pounds. Thus age, body weight, and cycle at first breeding are each noted to be important to the gilt's future performance within the herd. Much like what I already mentioned about the importance of selecting the right gilts into the herd, selecting the right animals, gilts, and sows to be bred is also very important. If we want to improve sow retention, we have to ensure quality animals are being bred. Now we're not against hitting breeding targets. We understand the importance of this. However, if we want to improve sow retention, we have to address the quality of animals being bred. Why are quality animals not being bred? Are we not selecting good quality animals into the herd? Are we not treating well in the GDU? What about sows coming out of lactation? Are we breeding females in poor body condition? This leads me to my next topic, and that is the importance of managing female body condition. When you combine good body condition with selection of high quality animals at breeding, breeding herd longevity is gonna improve. Thus, managing body condition during gestation is essential. There are several different ways to manage female body condition in gestation. I think we're most familiar with the visual body condition assessment. However, we have learned that this is certainly not the most objective approach. 
The most consistent method is to use a sow caliper that was developed by Dr. Mark Knauer at NC State. I can always tell farms that are using the calipers because body condition is extremely consistent. Thus, if you aren't using the calipers to evaluate body condition, I highly recommend it. The next question becomes, how often should we evaluate body condition? In general, we recommend a minimum of three time points during gestation for sows. The first being at weaning or breeding, and this is done to help group sows by body condition category and set them at the appropriate level of feed allowance. The second evaluation should occur at preg check, and this is done to readjust feeding levels based on their current body condition. The third evaluation should occur at the time of farrowing, and this is done to evaluate the gestation feeding program and determine if any adjustments need to be made. If sows are housed in stalls during the course of gestation, an additional measurement can be obtained at day 90. For gilts, PIC recommends measuring body condition only at the time of farrowing. The reason for this is there is a lack of data suggesting a clear range of caliper scores for gilts during gestation. But measuring at farrowing with the caliper and then again at weaning will allow producers to understand body condition losses in that first lactation and evaluate the gilt development program. This circles back to my previous comments made regarding gilt body weight at breeding. If gilts are being bred too heavy, they will enter into the farrowing house over conditioned and as a result, they will lose a tremendous amount of body weight during farrowing and this will have a negative effect on their subsequent reproductive performance, ultimately leading to early removal from the sow herd. Using the calipers on gilts as they enter farrowing and again at weaning allows us to evaluate the gilt development program and determine if any changes need to be made. A common question I get in the field is how do I manage body condition in group environments? With new regulations on sow group housing, specifically Proposition 12, this is an important topic to touch on. Managing body condition is a lot more challenging in these environments where females are not fed individually. However, you can still be very successful at this. The principles I just described don't change. Body condition still needs to be evaluated. We recommend separating thin females into their own pen to improve their body condition. The biggest advantage to electronic sow feeders is the ability to feed females individually in a group environment. However, body condition is managed the same as I've already described. Females still require individual attention to ensure they are eating enough feed, no different than if they were housed in individual gestation stalls. In this study, we see the variability in feed intake for gilts and sows housed in groups and fed with ESF. We have gilts in the first graph and parity one and two plus sows in the following graphs. Along the x-axis, we have the day of gestation and on the y-axis, we have feed intake. Each dot represents the feed intake for an individual sow for that specific day of gestation. If we start by looking at the gilts, we see that in early gestation, following entry into the pen, these gilts really struggle to consume feed. Their daily feed allowance is set at four and a half pounds a day. But look how many females in early gestation and throughout the course of gestation consume less than that on a daily basis. Why is that? These females need our attention. Many would say this is just the result of gilts learning how to consume feed in this new system. And that's a fair point, I agree. However, what about parity one and two plus sows? We see in these graphs they also struggle to get up on full feed, especially in early gestation, but we still see that variability throughout gestation. Thus, we have to make this a priority to understand why these females are not consuming their daily allowance of feed. Locate these animals and evaluate why they are not eating. Along with body condition management in different housing environments, I often get asked if treating sows will be different as we start to transition more and more to group housing. The short answer is no. Animal treatments are the same, only the approach is different. Identification and timely intervention of distressed sows is essential to today's conversation to improve sow longevity, regardless of the environment that they are housed in. A recent peer-reviewed public study found that only 22% of sows were treated properly with the right treatment protocol, meaning only 22% of sows received the correct drug, the correct dosage, and the correct duration of that drug, 22%. I do see this on farms, and this is my reasoning for discussing this with you today. Regardless of how animals are being housed, or if they are in gestation or in the GDU, they must be individually observed and evaluated every single day for any signs of distress or discomfort. And this includes animals not eating, any signs of lameness, infection, 
discharge, females not standing up, or anything that is outside of the norm. These animals should be clearly marked and identified to allow for proper treatment based on veterinarian recommendations. Farrowing is the final piece of the puzzle that I will be discussing today. Remember, I said in the beginning that sows are at the greatest risk for removal immediately before farrowing and in the first three weeks after farrowing. The suggestions I have already discussed in the GDU and gestation play a role in reducing these removals, but there are also opportunities in farrowing that can help with managing this as well. The first being water availability. Think about how much milk we are expecting females to produce for the 14, 15, 16 plus piglets that she has. Milk is over 80% water, thus she will be drinking several gallons of water per day. Water intake is the biggest concern in gilts, particularly when the water source in the farrowing crate is different than what she previously had in gestation. It is as simple as she can't find the water source. A few tricks we have learned is to load your farrowing room with all of your gilts in the same location. This makes it easier to manage these animals and provide them with additional attention. I have also found success by adding a small amount of peanut butter to the water nipple. This helps ensure they find the water source and confirms she is drinking water. Just like gestation, we recommend getting females up a minimum of once per day and touching the water nipple to show them how and where to drink, especially for gilts. Pay attention to these details as they are very important. Much like GDU and gestation, sow care and lactation is very important. Again, these are all things I am certain you already have an SOP for. I am just asking that you revisit that SOP and ensure team members are following through on the execution of these tasks. We recommend getting sows up at least once per day, observing the sow for any signs of lameness, infection, is she eating and drinking, is her feeder full, is it licked clean? These are all reasons for investigation. In addition to these observations, we also encourage obtaining rectal temperatures on females 24 hours after farrowing. We recommend this because we have seen the positive effects this has on improving survivability for sows and piglets. It will improve lactation feed intake, body condition, and in turn, subsequent reproductive performance. By obtaining rectal temperatures, you are able to detect problems in the newly farrowed sow before they can be observed otherwise. I remember being in farrowing and walking through my rooms every day and observing sows and their litters, or at least that was the goal. More than I would like to admit, I would come to a gilt or a sow that was pale, clearly no longer nursing her piglets and in need of intervention. When I got her up, if I could get her up, she would have marks all along the side of her body from the crate, indicating that she has not been up recently to eat or drink. Her piglets were at this point in need of a nurse sow and she needed to be moved back to gestation. And in addition to these tasks, I now needed to tighten my farrowing rooms. Each of these tasks, as you know, takes extra time, extra time that we rarely have. I'm recommending the rectal temperatures in females 24 hours after farrowing because I truly believe these temperatures will save us time in the long run. Doing this will allow us to identify females in need of intervention before our eye can detect it and reduce the number of females we find in the days to come that now need to be replaced with a nurse sow and removed to gestation. Thus, I truly feel this is an important task that we should be implementing in the Farrowing House. So to wrap things up, I really wanna emphasize the benefits to prioritizing what we have discussed today. Breeding quality animals is gonna improve your farrowing rate and decrease gestation removals. Managing body condition in gestation is going to allow for these females to enter into farrowing at an ideal body condition and maximize feed intake and lactation. And ensuring females in lactation have adequate water intake and care is going to ensure females wean a vigorous litter of piglets and return to the breed row at an ideal body condition, setting her up for success for her next litter. I understand the pressure you guys are already under and I'm not discounting that in any way, but I believe by reevaluating some of the topics I discussed today will only help you do your job more efficiently and wean more pigs out the door. Thanks for walking us through those on-farm management strategies, Lori. I appreciate you joining us today. Many of the tips and recommendations Lori shared today can be found in the PIC Guilt and Sow Guidelines Manual, which is located on our resources page on PIC.com. In addition to those guidelines, there are reproduction training videos, podcasts, and other tools under the Reproduction Resources section for you to access.